Hello and welcome back to Paleocast. My name is Dave Marshall and you're listening to episode 137 on Tannis with Melanie During of Erbsley University. Here we'll be talking about this remarkable and relatively newly discovered site of special preservation of fossils and from it we'll be examining all the lines of evidence that are helping to piece together the timing of the impact that caused the end Cretaceous mass extinction. We love to be able to talk about the latest stories just as soon as their embargoes break. So if you are a researcher and we know a lot of you listen, then why not consider speaking to us before your next press release? Then if you're a listener, please consider supporting us on Patreon so that we can bring these kinds of stories to you more often. I'll keep the intro short and sweet this week, so please make sure that you check out our website for the images and video that accompany this episode, and all the social media love you can give will always be greatly appreciated. Hi to our new backers on Patreon, and I hope you all enjoy this episode. Hi, Melanie. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Hi, Dave. Thank you very much for having me. So we always like to get to know our interviewee a little bit before we get started. And today, and just for you, and maybe in the future with some other people, I'm going to do some quickfire questions that I have not prepared you for. So Netherlands or Sweden? Oh, Oh, I miss my country. I really like the Netherlands. I'm going to say Netherlands. Hamilton or Verstappen? Oh, Verstappen. You know it. Favorite car? Oh, oh, I'm going to go for the favorite car I owned. A Fiat Punto convertible from 1994. Favorite band? Uh, uh, Motorhead. Favorite chocolate? Uh, Caramel salt. Favorite fossil? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, my paddlefish from Tannis that I scanned. Burgess Shale or Hell Creek? Oh, that's, that's mean. Hell Creek. Field work or media work? <gasps> oh, I mean, I love field work, but if I could get the chance to do more media work, I would grab it. Best thing about doing a PhD? Being able to do exactly what I love. Worst thing about doing a PhD. It's a lot of work, man. And favorite paleontology podcast. Yeah, come on, that's easy. Okay, I think you scored (laughs) uh, maybe one or two out of ten? Eleven? Yeah, 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 I thought so because I said for stopper. I said for stopper. Yeah. Yeah, I went for a four-seater convertible as a favorite car. (laughs) (laughs) Right, so how did you get involved in the field of paleontology? Uh, I actually took a little bit of a detour. Uh, So I did a a bachelor in physical geography um, uh, because that was actually the only university that would have me as I didn't have any STEM in in my high school uh, background. Uh, and they allowed me to do quick catch-up courses in physics, chemistry, maths. Uh, and then I told everybody that I wanted to study dinosaurs and do paleontology. And they were like, you're never going to get there. And that doesn't even exist. Uh, so I had to leave that university after my bachelor's. Uh, and I went to Utrecht and later to the Free University in Amsterdam, where I actually did a master's in paleoclimatology officially. but. I applied everything to bones and that's actually also how I sort of got into this project because I combined everything that I learned from paleoclimatology onto paleontology. Um, And throughout my bachelor's, master's, uh, I simply participated in every field work I could get my feet into. Uh, So did some excavations in Poland, south of France, Hell Creek, uh, Germany. Uh, but most of them actually in Winterswijk, which is uh, my little favorite Triassic Park. Um, yeah, so I slowly, gradually worked my way into paleontology. And what would you be doing if you weren't a paleontologist? That's such a tricky question. Um, 
I would undoubtedly be more active with my singing, maybe also with art. Um, I did get accepted into art school, but then again, I also got accepted into law school and I changed my mind <laughs> so quickly within that time that I eventually signed up for physical geography. And I, I remember everybody around me around that time in my high school, they were like, Melanie does not know what she wants to do. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting that impression. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I think they were right, but I, I think I did. I just, I didn't know it until I signed up for, well, officially it was called Earth Sciences, but it was definitely physical geography. Uh, but yeah, as a kid, I always played outside, always collected rocks, dead animals. My parents were, were, were very happy with me. Uh, and, and I guess that once I finally finished high school, I, I had sort of forgotten that. So I was looking for, yeah, everything else. And then when I had to make up my mind, um, I couldn't sleep that night. I signed up for law school. And then I just literally couldn't sleep. And in the middle of the night, I realized, no, I want to study the earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I sent them an email saying, I'm so sorry, please uh, ignore my admission and then signed up for earth sciences. I had uh, something fairly similar where uh, in high school I did business studies because my mum was like, no, you need to you need to do that. Make some money. And then yeah. a couple of lessons in, I was just like, no. No, I'm doing extra science, please. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, it sounds like you came into paleontology like a lot later than most people that we speak to on this yeah. show. Like yeah. people are always like, oh, I love dinosaurs ever since the moment I could even talk and it's all I ever wanted to be. Yeah, yeah, well, you... the thing is, apparently as a child, I always said I wanted to become an archaeologist. Well, mind you, none of my family members are have joined uh, uh, or have taken higher education. So I was the first. Mm. And, and to put it lightly, there were some issues when I grew up. So I also wasn't in a position where I even got to go to the movies to watch Jurassic Park. So in a sense, I had to discover the world a little bit by myself. So I started collecting shells and rocks and everything. So in a way, yes, I did, but I didn't come into contact with dinosaurs because I was a girl and people gave me Barbie dolls, which I set on fire, but <laughs> I didn't have any dinosaurs to play with as a child, no. Oh, uh, that's a wonderful image. And now you listen to Motorhead. Yeah. <laughs> and is your music is your singing in a similar vein uh i would say my my singing is uh, in range of uh, nirvana meets portishead uh i tried grunting it's not really my style but i, I do a, a pretty good lenny cover uh if i have enough whiskey yeah uh let's get drunk and just subject the audience to metal well, i mean i've got covid at the moment i'm quite sure i sound like lenny as well now let's see <laughs> <laughs> right and what are your current research projects what's your phd on my phd is on the evolution of uh, uh early tetrapods so the transition from fish to land animal i'm currently studying some scans of some tristicopterids so some yeah uh ancestors of ours that could not yet walk um and uh they've got some strange patterns in their tooth replacement that i'm looking at um so is and, this kind of like pre acanthostega in tiktalic that people yeah. would know yeah right. exactly yeah so more and, on the uh, fish side exactly more on the fish side uh, uh looking at ancestral uh traits um and, and and also in particular since for instance most um tetrapods have continuous tooth replacement uh i'm looking into how this came into being Oh, that's interesting. It is, if if I find it. <laughs> but uh, we'll see. And because uh, I work with a lot of synchrotron data, which is very time consuming because it requires segmentation, uh, a part of my PhD is also devoted to trying to figure out uh, um, ways to make this faster by using artificial intelligence and deep learning. So, yeah, it's a, it's a, that, that's the tough part, but uh, I'm, I'm more than eager to, to see if I can 
make that all go a little bit faster. Yeah, when um, when I'm thinking about uh, segmenting and synchrotron data and all that stuff, I like to think that, you know, if you see like a, a CT scan of a human brain, it's just kind of like a little slice through it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you remember like to about 2002 or something, there was all the rage for those 3D jigsaws that were kind of like uh, discs yeah. and you put them together and you would make a 3D bust of Darth Vader's head or Cleopatra. Yeah. or something like that yeah that's, exactly that's kind of what it is but like digitally yeah that's a it's a very nice description yeah exactly i wonder if you could uh actually make them did yeah, you 3d you could. print a puzzle yeah you could of course you could or you could not <laughs> uh i mean it depends if you have the printer <laughs> and the desire <laughs> and the skills someone someone out there it's a, I think it's uh, it's quite doable, actually. I mean, you can see now as well that some people are sharing the, the STL files, so the, the shape files of their segmentations. So, for instance, you can download an STL of, a, uh, I believe, of T-Rex tricks. It's a bit of a low, res, uh, low resolution, but you could print that for sure. Yeah. And if you want, you can divide it up into slices and turn it into a puzzle. But I mean, that, that's a bit of an unnecessary feature, I would bit say. Bit of a niche market. Yeah, yeah. Right. So we are not talking about any of that today. We are talking about the end Cretaceous mass extinction, which I think you did as part of your master's. Yep, it was my master's thesis, thesis project. Yep. Okay, so we, we've spoken in depth about it before, uh, but could you give us a, a refresher, a, a brief overview of what happened? Sure thing. So at the end of the Cretaceous, while everything was going fine for life on Earth, of course you had the deck and traps volcanism, um, but all in all, it appears that life on Earth was absolutely thriving. And then suddenly, likely from the Oort cloud, a giant asteroid came in, uh, it hit the Yucatan Peninsula and caused the, the, the mass extinction of, well, quite specifically, the dinosaurs, um, many marine reptiles, pterosaurs, ammonites, um, whereas mammals and birds actually came out just fine. Um, and uh, the impact caused, of course, a lot of Earth rock to also be shot out into space. And in particular, the heavy material from the meteorite itself, uh, iridium, uh, is, is, uh, has been identified actually globally. So there's been a layer of all of this dust and debris settling down on Earth after the impact. And, and that's how we know that it was a meteorite that killed the dinosaurs. So yeah, there's a, a global layer of iridium and plenty of evidence for this all around the world. But then there's been a relatively new Lagerstätte, which is a site of special preservation in this instance, uh, called Tanis. So where is it and how old is it? Well, Tanis is located in almost the extreme southwestern point of North Dakota. So if you have the square on the map, it's literally the low right, uh, low left corner. And uh, Tanis is a river deposit uh, where a Saiche entered. And I will explain that in a bit. Uh, and it is exactly 66 million years old. Okay. Uh, so, what is a Saichi? 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 Mm -hmm. I um, don't even know how to pronounce it. I've actually heard Saich once, Saish? so I could be wrong altogether by saying Saichi, but I, I've, stuck, I've stuck to Saichi for so long now that it's, it's hard to get rid of. Well, I've, I've never heard the word until I read your paper and spoke to you. So, <laughs> what is it? How does it differ from a tsunami, and why have I, and presumably all of our listeners, not heard of it before? Well, a is uh, the, the. I'll start with the similarity. A is a giant wave, like a tsunami is, uh, with a a, a, a potential um, tectonic origin. But a tsunami radiates outward from a single point, so from an earthquake in the ocean or against the ocean, and then moves very slowly across the ocean, 
which is why you often hear of uh, tsunami warnings hours in advance. And a sideje is um, uh, uh, also caused by tectonic disturbance, but on the continental plate. And it is often constricted to confined bodies of water. So if you have a lake on the continental plate, then you can best compare it to a, a pool during an earthquake. It just gets slushed sideways, back and forth, back and forth. And that's a sideje. And the biggest difference is because the shock wave moves through the continental plate, um, the, the, the first shaking of the water can be almost instantaneous, in, whereas a tsunami would take hours to reach such a distance. Okay, so when the T-Rex in Jurassic Park is stomping around mm -hmm. and the water starts shaking, <laughs> yeah. that's kind of the same. <laughs> you mean a uh, tiny sideshow in the cup? Tiny sideshow in the cup. You could call that a tiny sideshow in the cup, yes. Whereas if you were <laughs> in a lake or a body of water and the T-Rex was stomping around in that, the waves from that would be more like a tsunami because they yeah, come or, or like like uh, dive bombing in a pool. Uh... This is incredibly convoluted. I've made this more complicated than <laughs> it needed have. to be. You have. <laughs> <laughs> I would just stick to the tiny side chair in the cup and just end there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was trying to <laughs> trying to put in some pop culture references. You know, make myself yeah, sound yeah, cool, no, hip and Honestly, happening. I think the the side chair in the cup. That 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 still works, but then afterwards it just gets a little confusing. <laughs> yes, quite. Anyway, now that we've cleared all that up and everyone knows mm -hmm. exactly what it's about, um, you say that this deposit was formed uh, in a river. So mm -hmm. it's a side sheet in a river. Is that right? So what is likely what happened here is that Roughly around 66 million years ago, the Western Interior Seaway, which uh, used to be a seaway in the middle of North America, it was already starting to dry up a little bit. So there was no longer a connection to the Gulf of Mexico, but you had these remnant uh, deposits of that. So you had like uh, shallow sea remnants in the middle of North America. And what likely happened is that one of these uh, got blown into the Tanis River. So that was the Saichi. The Saichi was in the Western Interior Seaway moving upstream into the Tanis River. And the reason I say that is because what we find in there are benthic foraminifera, so not planktonic, but benthic. So there was not a high water column. Um, and shark teeth and ammonites and all that sort of stuff. But also sturgeons which are anadromous or at least today they are and we assume those were as well so they likely moved from salt water to fresh water to seawater sorry to fresh water and um and these got merged in into the river with paddle fishes which are 100 percent freshwater fish uh, and that mixing tells me that the side caused uh this this remnant sea to be mixed with the river Okay, so the river was flowing out into that remnant sea? Exactly. Okay, why could it not be the case that we have an evolutionary ancestor of a paddlefish that was saltwater? Can you rule that out? Uh, yes, I can, because I did oxygen isotope analysis on the bones of the paddlefish, and they don't show the variation that you would expect from a either marine or migrating fish. Well, there we go. That's an emphatic answer. <laughs> okay. Okay. A, a more difficult one. Uh, mm -hmm. How can you tell that this deposit formed so soon after the impact? Well, that's actually because uh, it's absolutely laced with impact spherules. And these impact spherules are the pieces of earth rock that got flung out into space and then rained down afterwards. And we find them in the gills of these fishes and we find them in tiny impact tunnels or funnels, whatever you want to call them, in the deposit itself. But we don't find them further down the digestive tract of these fishes. We don't find them penetrating the fish's post-mortem. So, and we know that these 
uh, impact ferals at the size range that we have them, they must have landed back on Earth within 15 to 30 minutes after the impact. Yeah, that's quite a lucky deposit. <laughs> it is an extremely lucky deposit, yeah. To to be able to date, I mean, we're used to dating things in, you know, tens, hundreds of millions of years. I mean, if we're lucky, we'll get to the millennium timescale, but yes. And yet here you are relatively dating something to within 15 to 30 minutes of an event that happened 66 million years ago. Yep. That's, it's unbelievable that you can it's get It's insane. That. It's insane. When I started this project, I immediately realized how incredibly unlikely it was for this to be discovered in the first place. Yeah. Um, so the, the fossils that are in there, though, okay, so we've had this massive, colossal wave that brought in yep. salt water upstream and, uh, yeah, just completely ruined everyone's day uh, <laughs> if the asteroid impact hadn't already done that. Um, yep. How well preserved are the fossils? Are they amazingly well preserved as well or are they just like tiny little fragments and bits and pieces considering oh, no. they've just been hit by a giant wave i would wave? say i would say it's like a car wreck and then frozen so it's uh, it's a very violent deposit a lot of fish are folded around tree branches or over each other on top of each other so that part is really violent so a lot of the fishes are like slightly skewed or slightly contorted or some are completely ripped open but then they are perfectly preserved. So I've got fast, uh, soft tissue preservation. Um, when I look at the geochemical analysis of the bones, I can see that there is a perfect, uh, um, we call it an iron seam formation. So all of the blood vessels, all the minerals in the blood vessels have settled in place, sealing off the bone. Uh, and there's no... Um, almost no diagenetic alteration of the bones itself. Oh, that's special. This is yeah. like a, the holy grail of fossil deposits. Yes, yes. I look forward to many more of these being being discovered in the future. Uh, I mean, that would be absolutely amazing. Okay. Um, you've, you've also dropped in that we have plant fossils in there as well, tree branches and stuff. So there's yeah. a terrestrial element in there as well um, yeah i think that wave partially moved over land it, it it was a big wave is there the potential for finding terrestrial animals might there be yes a bit of absolutely. a dinosaur in there oh yes absolutely i mean when i excavated there there was uh, for certain uh, a, a, a T Rex, oh, sorry, a Triceratops just below the deposit. So I think that that was probably already dead. So it got mostly moved by the deposit. Um, but I mean, there's still, a, a, I would say, 30 to 60. It really sort of depends on how it moves inwards further. Uh, square meters left to discover. And it has a thickness of roughly two meters. So, I mean, there's. There's so much potential for finding uh, more specimens, for finding dinosaurs and, and whatnot. Um, but so far, all the dinosaur material that I found were, yeah, scattered teeth. And we all know that they just shed them in life. So I think the wave just brought them in. Um, but that doesn't exclude the possibility of them also being caught in there. Okay, what's it actually like in the field? If you were to teleport us there right now, what would it look like? What would it be like? Well, I mean, uh, if you know a little bit about sedimentology and you know a little bit about like turbidites and strange uh, like cross bedding and, and, and that sort of structure, it looks like that, but then on a very large scale. So you can see literally a wave coming in and then just above there, a wave going back. You can actually see that it's it goes in and then back and then in and then back. And then when you look at the fishes in the field, you can actually see that they're deposited in the direction of flow, which is absolutely insane. Wow. But like as as a um a modern 
a geographical feature? Is it in the side of a cliff? Is it a lovely rolling hill? Is it all eroded and weathered, or is it all perfect there's and quite, beautiful? There's quite some erosion, um, but I mean, if you uh, if you move further in the site, then it's not so bad. So. Um, it's literally like a butte. Uh, the Hell Creek is quite well known for its buttes, so it's not as far eroded down, but it is currently undergoing erosion. And and you can tell that because on the edge you suddenly see rows and rows of scutes of sturgeons, uh, and the rest of the fish is just gone. Um, and if you move further in the field, or if you dig further into the deposit, then you find the the, the perfectly preserved specimens but i think we all know that they need to be excavated asap um, yeah because yeah this this deposit is currently undergoing uh erosion and with the current climate of north dakota being more and more affected by climate change so it's extremely hot in summer and it's extremely cold in winter those are not good conditions no um how is it being excavated um uh, are people really focusing on trying to get everything out? Because it seems like such an important uh, I would discovery. say absolutely yes. The, I, I mean, I've only gone to the site once and I would absolutely love to be invited back. But um, when I was there, of course, I was there to collect material for my study, but I also helped excavate uh, pretty much every fish we found and when we couldn't take the fishes with us we at least plaster jacketed for them them for the winter so yes uh the the priority is really to excavate everything asap okay is is the site protected yep. is it known about by the public i don't think that that's particularly the case but i'm not uh I'm not sure at the moment. I do know that the site is protected. There's a fence around it. There's locals um, being asked to monitor it. Right. Uh, but it's not like BLM material. Okay. I, w I would quite like to go and dig up like 15 oh, yeah. minutes after the end yeah. Cretaceous mass extinction. Yeah, exactly. Fish. Have it on my mantelpiece. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I think technically you could, but at the same time, I'm not. I'm always, I'm always sort of hesitant for the real collecting, uh, just for the collecting part. Because mm. it would be great on your mantelpiece, but it would be greater if you could scan it. Oh, for sure. <laughs> right. So, talking about scanning fish, um, mm -hmm. what exactly? <laughs> have you been looking at and why so like what were your research questions well first of all i wanted to know that the fish is indeed i just wanted to confirm that the fishes indeed died because of the impact so if they indeed had the impact spherules in their gills and not further throughout their digestive tract so that's why i scanned one of the fishes at at the European synchrotron. And secondly, I wanted to know if I could reconstruct the latest Cretaceous seasonality. So if bones from these fishes, and I, I, for this I chose the, uh, the jaws of the paddle fishes uh, and the pectoral fin spines, so the shoulder fin spines of the sturgeons, if they indeed recorded seasonality, and if uh, all of them indeed recorded the same seasonality, and if they all died at the same moment. Okay, so... You chose the, the jaw and the spines on the shoulders. Um, why those bones in particular? And do all fish bones in general grow in the same way and show growth lines? Um, so I chose the dentary or jawbone of the paddlefish and the pectoral fin spine of the sturgeon because they both grow appositionally, which means they literally grow a new ring on the outside every year uh, without remodeling. And no, other bones do not also grow in these ways. Uh, they will grow with growth lines, um, but they tend to remodel. And then you get a, a, yeah overwriting of the growth lines, and then it's hard to tell what you're looking at. So I stuck specifically to uh, a dermal or a perichondral bones uh, from these fishes, and that th those are hard words for 
non-remodeling bones or difficult words for non-remodeling bones. Right. And and what causes these rings to form? So I like to think that it looks like the, the rings of a tree. Um, what what are we looking at when we see those rings? And well, what do they tell us? Exactly. Uh, they, they look like tree rings because they grow quite similarly. Um, when a growth stop, uh, starts in a year, uh, it actually at first looks like it stops. It's a bit uh, confusing perhaps, but you have to imagine it like this. Before you can grow a new layer, new layer you have to stop the old layer. So that's when the, uh, uh, the line of arrested growth or lag is formed. And then you get a real rapid bone cell deposition. And that happens when food is prolific, when there's uh, a, a lot to go around for. So that's what you get in spring and summer. You have this, this rapid growth. And then when food availability drops down, uh, growth slows down. And then you get lamellar bone growth. Uh, and that's what we call an annulus. And then at the end of an annulus, nearing winter, when there's really nothing more to go around for, uh, that's when growth stops. And again, once spring commences, then first the line of arrested growth is deposited, and then you get back into bone cell deposition. How do you know the polarity of the bands and which season they represent? And then, bonus question, is that the seasons are expressed differently depending on your latitude so if you're right close to the pole the difference between the seasons is going to be absolutely huge but if you're on the equator it's going to be a lot less and oh, this... exactly there is no seasonality at the equator not now not then so these would have been further south and closer to the equator so no they were not close to the equator uh tanis north dakota uh at that point in 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 time was uh, roughly 50 degrees north i was going to say so, relative to the north pole <laughs> yeah so it it it's very seasonal very sensitive to seasonality uh and i actually knew that before i started this project because i knew what i was looking for so i wanted to know if the place had seasonality to begin with um but according to tree rings, uh, there was a very clear seasonality with like summer highs of 19 degrees, winter lows of four degrees. Uh, so you've got this real variability in, in, in temperature and, and precipitation. Uh, so I knew that in advance. Um, but yeah, the, the polarity of the bands, I love how you describe that. Because many people look at the growth bands and say, oh, it's light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. And then light is either summer or winter and vice versa. But it's just not that simple. And that's actually also why I didn't look at color, because color here is just not your not your takeaway. It's really the microstructure. So the osteocyte lacunae, which are like these the, the remnants of these bone cells that I talked about, uh, they leave these very clear, almost star-shaped uh, um, interconnected um patterns when the bone is growing and when the bone growth is slowing down you get this this uh, rapid concession of very narrow lines um and because i had a synchrotron scan i didn't just have these lines i actually had them as a plane um so there they could be very easily identified um and and that's actually also what helped because especially the the sturgeon uh pectoral fin spines, so these shoulder fin spines, uh, they had um, quite a large muscle attachment because they were uh, swimming with them. So you have all of these um, uh, Sharpie's fibers obscuring uh, the growth patterns if you just looked at a thin section. But if you, if you then look at the synchrotron data, then you can see very clearly where the bone growth is highest and where the bone growth is lowest. And we even did a, a quantified analysis of the bone cell uh, or, or osteocyte, if you want to call it, um, uh, volume and how they increased throughout the year in succession over f multiple years in, in one of our paddlefishes. So yeah, we could tell very clearly, okay, many osteocytes uh, was uh, summer, a uh, few osteocytes was uh, autumn, no or almost no osteocytes, but definitely clearly 
um, uh, lamellar bone growth was autumn. And then when everything ceased, it was winter. Right. So before we look at what that exactly tells us about which season this all happened in, uh, you also were looking at the chemistry of the bones. What were you looking at there and what does the chemistry of the bones tell us? So at first I did a micro x-ray fluorescent analysis on the bones. And I mostly did that because I wanted to make sure that the preservation was good. So I looked if there was any like silica leaching into the bone uh, or any other elements from the sediment leaching into the bone or vice versa. And none of this had taken place. So that was very promising. And then I micro milled uh, the bones, I cut some thick sections from it and I micro milled them to do oxygen isotope analysis and carbon isotope analysis. Uh, we do them together, actually. Um, and that was a very tough and mostly unsuccessful task because uh, <laughs> the sturgeon bones were far too curved. If you look at a sturgeon uh, pectoral fin spine in cross-section, it's almost like a, an oak leaf. It has all of these very clear lobes. Uh, so every growth ring follows that lobed structure, and that's extremely difficult for the micro mill to, to, to drill into because it just could not accept the curvature. So you kept drilling into the next growth mark, which is something you really don't want because then you're mixing and you're trying to, uh, to collect the data from one season at a time. So that, that was not an option. Um, the paddle fishes were a bit more successful. Uh, because the dentary didn't have such a, a curved structure, I could more easily just follow along and um, and and the, and the micro mill could handle that. So that I, I got a really good record from that. And then I did uh, uh, oxygen and carbon uh, analysis and the especially the carbon record gave us a lot of information. So the ox oxygen record doesn't show that much. It doesn't have large variability and it's quite simply because uh, the fresh water that these fishes were living in didn't vary so much. Um, so um, there was not a, a, a seasonal um, change in water flow necessarily. Um, and, and it confirms that the fish, fishes didn't migrate into marine waters or uh, do anything exotic. And the, however, the, the carbon record, uh, what it shows is, and, and I have to quickly explain that a little bit. So paddle fishes are filter feeders and they, uh, they feed on microorganisms. Um, and if you look at that part of the food chain, what you see is that uh, if, you, if they eat a lot, then the carbon-13, the heavier carbon, increases. And if they don't eat a lot, then the carbon-13 decreases relatively. So what we see is that when spring came, the carbon-13 was going up. When summer came, it was reaching its maximum. When autumn came, it was dropping down. And when it was winter, it was like at a minimum because there was no consumption, so there was no increase in carbon-13. And from this one paddlefish, we have a perfect record showing, I believe, almost seven years of increase and decrease of carbon-13. And uh, because I, uh, I know exactly where I micro-milled it, I, I actually have screen captures of that with a scale bar, uh, and I plotted that next to our uh, histological interpretation. And you can clearly tell that when the bone cells increase, uh, that's when carbon-13 increases and when you reach a line of arrested growth. So literally winter, is it's when carbon-13 is often at its lowest. That's incredible that you can see that. So just to run that through in my head, and please jump in to correct me wherever mm -hmm. I am going to be wrong. So the micro milling is essentially uh, just drilling into this bone. Yeah. And then you've got something that looks at the different elements that are given off yeah, as you drill a mass, through. A mass spectrometer, but yes. Uh, no, not as I drill through it. I mean, I had to, uh, so I drilled through it, then I collected the samples. Then I had to uh, use the microbalance to measure 
enough of the material to put into, into the mass spectrometer. And then in the mass spectrometer, you flush everything with helium so that there's no uh, contamination from the air. And then finally, you measure the CO2 composition of that specimen. And that gives you the relative oxygen 16 versus 18 and the relative carbon 12 versus 13. So you milled through uh, line by line, yep. growth line by growth line. Yeah. Oh, that sounds like a lot of work. It was. It was. Okay. I think. I think the majority of my entire thesis was micro milling and weighing. <laughs> and so then the oxygen isotope that is a measure of, effectively, it's a proxy for how much um, water is has been evaporated from the sea and then kept on land as ice. If right. you measure an oceanic record, yes, but I have a, a freshwater record, so it's it is a measure of precipitation and evaporation, yes, but not necessarily of ice. Oh right, in my okay. case, yeah. And, and it depends. And it depends on what you measure. You can definitely use it for ice. I think it's more more commonly used for ice, actually. But the the basis of that is the the lighter um, isotope of ox uh, oxygen is mm -hmm. evaporated preferentially. And the heavier the one, heavier. and the heavier one rains down preferentially. Right there, we go. Yep. And then the carbon. Mm -hmm. the... That is a bit of a different structure. So in 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 photosynthesis, what you see is that um, um, phytoplankton, for instance, they preferentially use carbon twelve because it's lighter to make sugar, and they cannot really use carbon thirteen, so they deposit it in their exoskeleton, which is why it subsequently enriches the food chain. Okay, so the carbon thirteen is heavier. Heavier. And that's why it gets deposited in the exoskeleton and that anybody who eats these uh, microorganisms gets enriched in carbon-13 because they're eating those exoskeletons that are rich in carbon-13. Okay, so as you mill through the bone, you can see uh, the areas in which it's growing the fastest mm -hmm. based on the spacing of the cells and the size of the... Um, yeah, the, the density and the volume of the of the osteocytes, yes. And then you can also measure how much precipitation has been going on and how much the fish was eating at that time. Yeah. That's incredible. And it all lined up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, but I had to wait uh, the time between recognizing the seasons from the bones and and getting finally this this one record of isotopes from the lab that was the most stressful time and i'll never forget when i got the phone call from suzanne who did the analysis saying we've got a record up to the end and i i i don't i don't even remember what i was doing but i knew i wasn't at the lab and i i just jumped on my bike and you went straight for the lab to see the results okay yeah. and what were the results? Well, the results were that uh, carbon isotopes were just, carbon-13 was just increasing after a winter. So after a low point. But it was not yet at its summer maximum. When you say that, is is that the, the last ring That's the recorded last ring. in yeah. all of your fish? Yeah. I mean, I, I could only... Re I could only do isotope analysis successfully in one fish. Okay. Um, but I have the osteohistology of six fishes, and this carbon isotope record fit perfectly. Right, and, and every single one of them, it indicated that spring was yeah. when they all died. If you look at the died. histology of all of the fishes, then all of them confirm that it's spring when they died. And it's just the one isotopic record that further confirms that it was spring. Uh, were there any unexpected results in any of this? Like, could you spot a fish that had a particularly bad summer, for instance, where it didn't eat as much as oh, some yeah, of the others? Oh, yeah, they were there. They were there. I mean, you could tell that some of them uh, didn't have great seasons, and some of them had, like, magnificent seasons, that you were looking at it and being like, whoa, we're still in summer. Holy this is a big fish. Um, 
but yeah, there was definitely some uh, inter specimen variability here. And in particular, I would say the paddlefish, I think like three or four summers before it died, had like a massive, amazing summer. Um, and both the isotope record as well as the, the osteoestology have that very clearly. Okay. Could you perform this kind of analysis on modern fishes? Has there been a precedent for doing that? And then oh, yeah, how accurately, how sure can you be that your result is correct? I think you could. Uh, but uh, the main challenge is that many of modern fishes have their food availabilities dr drastically altered by humans because every almost every river you see has dams in it. Um, I mean, we all know of the spring and autumn algal blooms, but if you now look at rivers, then there's like um when when the river flow gets up to its maximum that's when the dams start working and that that is a really hampering effect on food availability for fishes uh and also they cannot migrate upstream or they cannot migrate to lakes where there would be other food that they would normally go for so yes it's possible but you'd have to find uh fishes that are not affected by this and i think that that is the biggest challenge here um mm -hmm. but uh, other than that for sure yes of course you can just uh, follow them along, see how they're eating for a couple of years, then cut up their bones, um, scan them, uh, and do all isotope analysis. Yeah, you can do that. I don't see why not. Okay, I was just trying to see if there's like, I don't know, some lag or something that, that your methods can be proven with modern fish. Oh, yes, you can. I mean, the only thing I don't think will be very clear are lines of arrested growth, but if you... If you scan the bones, then you can still see them. The thing about lines of arrested growth is that they often color during fossilization. So they're there when, when the fish is recent, but if there's, if there's no fossilization, if it hasn't hardened, then the line of arrested growth is not colored, but you can still recognize the structure of the, of the annulus and then the subsequent uh, osteocyte increase again. So yes, you could do this. Okay, so we now know that this deposit was 15 to 30 minutes after the impact. We now know that the impact was in spring. We're building yeah. up a, a decent picture of what the world was doing at the time that this all happened. Yeah. But why does the season of the impact matter? I mean, we've, we've got an era of thousands of years of when it happened. I mean, why? I mean, it's only ever going to be one of four seasons. Oh, yes, of we course. We know it's going to be one of them. Yeah, but, uh, but of course that matters because no matter which way you look at it, this impact was catastrophic. And it all comes down to this. If you and your entire species or clade or whatever were on the surface at the moment of impact, you were extinct. It is that simple. So why does the season matter? Well, if it was autumn or winter and say you were hibernating in a burrow, then you may actually have a chance of survival. I'm not going to say that you were able to survive every bit of the catastrophe that this impact brought but you were able to at least survive that first hit and that is something so and if you look then at the at the at the difference so you know if it's spring in the northern hemisphere it means it's autumn in the southern hemisphere and if you if you look at the difference in the recovery time then you can see that in the southern hemisphere it looks like it recovered almost twice as fast as in the Northern Hemisphere. And I don't think that's a coincidence. So in springtime, when plants are just having their new leaves, flowers are blooming, animals are foraging, looking for partners, or maybe they even already have offspring, um, they're at a much more delicate phase in their life than in the Southern Hemisphere, where they were preparing for winters, plants had already shed their leaves, which makes them a lot more robust. Um, and and many animals are capable of burrowing, and especially in autumn, I would say that they were preparing for winter and doing so. 
So there's a real difference in that sense. And I mean, if it was autumn in the Northern Hemisphere and spring in the Southern Hemisphere, I would expect a different pattern. Uh, but I do have to add this footnote. If we look at the records of latest Cretaceous flora and fauna globally, then you see a tremendous amount of information from the Northern Hemisphere. And when you look at the Southern Hemisphere, it's very scarce. So this needs to be taken into consideration. And I think that when, we, when future researchers are, are focusing on this, uh, trying to explain the selectivity of the KPG ex extinction, they actually also really have to look for more data from the Southern Hemisphere. Is that uh, availability of rocks and fossils, or is that uh, areas of focus of modern paleontologists? I would dare say the latter. Uh, and I would dare say the latter. And, and when it comes to the ones that do focus, we have to be very careful. I think you just touched base on this subject, uh, on the colonialism of paleontology. So uh, if you look at the institutions that are there in the Southern Hemisphere, and in particularly throughout Africa and throughout South America, uh, they are not very well funded. And, and that hampers research. So where in... Among, amongst all the four seasons, where would spring rank as like the potential worst or best case scenario for the I, timing I would, of this impact? Wow, very good question. I, I would actually think it was the worst because, I mean, everything was... It, it, picture it like this, and I know that this is not a proper anal analogy, but picture it like this. You've got a vegetable garden. It's spring and you're starting up your garden. Everything is coming up. It's starting to bloom. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, uh, you get a massive frost or you get a massive disaster. Then everything's dead immediately. If it was summer and you already had some fruit on it, uh, which means the plants already spread some seeds, uh, some animals already eaten from it, and then it happened, it's very unlikely, but uh, it would have not been as catastrophic. And autumn, when plants already shed their leaves, they're quite sturdy and ready for winter. And I think that because spring, I mean, you have to imagine it like this. Some animals were still in their eggs. Uh, incubation time matters. How many offspring matters. But all of these animals were likely above ground and they were exposed. And in likely in the southern hemisphere uh, animals were sheltering and and sleeping and and, and shutting down non-vital functions of their bodies to survive harsher times uh, well harsher times happened so if you're prepared for harsher times in autumn and winter i think you're a lot less vulnerable to a catastrophic event than say in spring is it now case closed as far as the timing of the event is concerned Ooh. I mean, I would never say that. I would never say that because I, I don't know what high resolution record we are yet to uncover. Uh, I wouldn't exclude the possibility of a higher resolution record existing, though at the moment I couldn't think of one. <laughs> so I, I would never say case closed. Um, uh, but I think the main goal at this point is to look for uh, Tannis duplicates. I don't think that Tannis will be the only site deposit that there is. It wouldn't surprise me if we're going to find more. And they're going to have their own set of unique evidence for the conditions of the latest Cretaceous. And even Tannis itself? Are there more secrets to be uncovered in oh. there? Definitely, I, I don't I don't think we're halfway in the deposit even. So, uh, and um, I mean, it's only when you excavate it you find what's there, and and so far every time it's a surprise. And you've, yeah, you've you've found out that it happened in spring. Uh, that's an amazing result. But what relevance does it have? Can you use that to say anything about the, the modern world? Well, I think we're currently facing the sixth mass extinction, and although it doesn't move as fast um, 
as as the the the, the uh, and Cretaceous extinction, it does put into perspective when life is at its most vulnerable. So yeah, I think it I think it shed lights on the future mass extinctions. And then just to end on, how do you feel with uh, this your master's studies uh, master study getting published in Nature? Um, I couldn't even say dream come true because I didn't think that this would ever be a possibility. I mean, I just, I just wanted to find something amazing, which I did, of course. And of course I wanted a nice grade because I wanted to get into a PhD <laughs> program somewhere fancy, but, um, no, I never dreamed of this. This is beyond belief. And I mean, I think like one of my supervisors actually kept saying, it's never going to get into nature. It's never going to get into nature. And I think that that was not demotivational. I think he was just trying to keep me realistic because most of whatever is submitted to nature gets desk rejected within a week. So I was sort of braced for that. Um, so now that we're here, I still am pinching myself quite frequently that my master thesis got published in Nature. And I, I don't think I'll do that many times during my PhD, but at least I did it for my master thesis. So that's, yeah, that's beyond belief. Oh, will it be the cover? <gasps> I don't know. I submitted a painting. <laughs> <laughs> Your own one or Joshua's? Yeah, no, my own. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that normal for a nature submission just be like here's my so. paper and if you want it this could be your front cover <laughs> yeah well I, I i figured i had to give it a go i also submitted some some nice uh um cross polar images of the bones but yeah I, I had to submit my own painting i painted it actually uh in the weeks coming up to my master thesis defense to deal with the stress <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, like, because I've seen like people, if if they get a nature cover, they'll um, they'll frame it and stick it on the wall. But you've got the original art. <laughs> yeah, but actually, my, my mom does, and I told her she could stick it on the wall. And has she? I should ask her. Actually, I should ask her. It's quite a conversation piece, isn't it? And and here's my daughter's <laughs> nature <laughs> paper artwork. Well, I mean, it, it, it she's could an just... artist and a scientist. <laughs> I mean, it could just be that it never makes it to the cover, and then that sense, it's uh, she has to explain why there's a dead triceratops on a riverbank and a giant <laughs> wave coming inwards with all of this glowing <laughs> rocks from the sky. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I I I stored all of my stuff in the Netherlands in my mom's house, so I asked her to pull it out to take a proper picture of it so I could submit it, and then I told her you can put it on the wall. Is is that the one with Joshua? No, 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 no. This is no. a separate one that I've yeah, not seen. Yeah, because I've submitted it to the cover, which means I need to keep it in hiding because the print won't be out until March 3rd. Ah, well, I feel yeah. not special. Well, if you want, I can share privately with you the yeah, picture you, of you my should. painting. You I will. Should. Thanks. I will. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I will, I will. Right. Um, that's about everything then, I guess. Uh, yeah. yeah, unless there's anything we're missing. No, I don't think so. I'm going to have a press briefing, by the way. A press briefing? Yeah, with Nature. So oh. they're inviting journalists for a press briefing on the 22nd. And what happens in that? Do you appear as a yes. person? Yes, uh, to together with Dennis and Jeroen, so two of my co-authors, uh, and we're going to... Uh, sort of pitch our story to journalists and then they're going to ask us questions. And they're going to publish their articles slightly moments after the Paleocast one releases. Exactly. This You're like, you are going to be on point, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and their articles wouldn't be as good as if we hadn't have prepped you with all this media experience. I don't. I, I. I think you're absolutely right. I know I am. So, yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks so much, Dave. Right. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show today. Well, thank you very much again for having me. It was a. It was a great experience. 
Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall and Liz Martin Silverstone, with contributions from Tom Fletcher, Vish Venkat, and Elsa Pancharoli. Music was composed by Patrick Kendall Smith. Paleocast was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on funding from you, the listeners. So, if you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programs, and follow us across social media platforms to get all the latest news. Finally, if you enjoy our podcast, then please explore all of our video content on YouTube and follow our other projects, the Virtual Natural History Museum and the Paleocast Gaming Network.